So with this video, we're going to go ahead and finish up chapter eight, looking at uh, creep now. So creep is a deformation process that is a fairly slow process, proceeds gradually with time, and it happens mainly at high temperatures. And by high temperatures, we're talking about greater than typically about half the melting point. So you'll see a range of anywhere from 0.3 to 0.6 times the melting point. Most of the time, I'll just say something like half. Okay. But once you start getting to a significant fraction, so 30% of the melting point, then you should start being concerned about creep um, and double checking that in terms of your design. So creep rupture occurs when a material gradually just tears apart as a result of ex excessive creep deformation. This is uh, strain, large, very large strains that result in the tearing and final failure of a material. So an example of creep would be uh, taking a wire of something like say we have a wire of lead and we hang it with a weight on the end. And if we did that, we would get some stretching of the wire initially that would be elastic. And then if we just left it alone, you would eventually see that it continues to strain very slowly and then eventually it would neck and fail. So this is a plot here of the strain, creep strain versus time. And the difference between the creep effect versus a, a tension test is remember tension tests, we're increasing the stress as a function of time measuring strain. In creep, you're basically applying a single stress value and then you're just monitoring it over time and it continues to deform. So if we take a look at this um, particular plot here, the first thing we would see in terms of the stages is once we apply a load at times t equals zero, we would get this instantaneous deformation. This is the, the elastic piece. And this is gonna be governed by <clears throat> our Hooke's law. So that's our elastic piece. So in many of your problems you'll you'll see that as, as a given along with this primary region. So between the instantaneous elastic piece and the primary piece, this is a relatively short time on our time axis here. And this time axis is actually on a log scale. So that's a relatively short time. Uh, and the creep numbers for this is also relatively small. It's a little bit exaggerated on this plot. But the, these two would typically be given and then it's the secondary creep region that we'd be analyzing where we've got this constant strain versus time. Okay, this is our creep rate. And then eventually as it gets towards the end when we're starting to neck and eventually rupture, that would be our tertiary creep. creep. All right, so <clears throat> let's see what um, things affect the creep rate. So if we were uh, below, let's say, here they're using four tenths of the melting point. So again, this number is gonna be anywhere from 0.3 to 0.6 or so. But when we're significantly below the melting point, you may see the instantaneous elastic piece. You may see some primary creep region, but then essentially the creep stops. And so you have now just a level value of strain. Okay, so we're not continuing to creep in this case. But as you pick the temperature up, then you're gonna see a continual rise in the creep strain versus time. So now these curves could represent a change in the creep strain versus temperature, where this would be the max temperature, or it could represent a constant temperature and the top curve would represent the maximum stress put on a sample. So the more stress you would say hang on that wire, the faster the creep rate would also be. And then of course, this endpoint is what's considered the time to rupture. So here's some uh, data curves just for that secondary creep rate, where we've got that um, steady state creep value. Here we're looking at now the steady state creep, okay, so that slope that we have there versus the stress 
that's applied to a sample, this is a nickel alloy, also as a function of temperature. So you've got, first, first, you got both the stress and the temperature in here as a function of creep rate. All right, so let's say that these labels weren't on here again. And we wanted to know which curve was taken at the highest temperature. So again, just go ahead and fix the stress value at some level. So we got a constant stress on our sample. And then what we can do is just go ahead and just extrapolate these lines for the sake of analyzing this, this plot. But you know, this one here is gonna have a creep rate somewhere back there. It's gonna have a creep rate here, right? <clears throat> this one would intersect way out here. So at a constant applied stress value, you can see that this bottom curve, this bottom curve here, has the maximum steady state creep rate. So it's creeping the fastest. So that means that must be the highest temperature, right? So this is your highest temperature. Right? And likewise, this has a very low creep rate. So that must be your lowest temperature. Right? So just trying to again show you how to reason out these kinds of plots. And also this is telling you the information that they're trying to get across. So for a fixed stress, as the temperature goes up, the creep rate goes up. And then of course the rupture time, which is not on here, but the rupture time then would decrease. If I'm creeping faster, then I'm gonna to get to my rupture time quickly. So here is that effect. This is the rupture time now versus stress and temperature. So now for a fixed stress value, we got this curve here, which has a very short rupture time. If we imagine this curve kind of extrapolating over, it would have a very long rupture time. Well, a very short rupture time then would mean that it must be at the highest temperature. All right, so these previous curves are useful for thing, finding things like rupture time and steady state creep rate. But the only problem is, is that I've got only a couple of temperatures and if my temperatures are outside of this range or between these values, um, then I'm gonna have to do some kind of interpolation, figure out where we might be on there. And that becomes a bit of a pain. So we'd like a method that would allow us to take into account the stress that's applied, the temperature that's applied and give us out a rupture lifetime. And that's where this plot called the Larson-Miller plot comes in. So what we have plotted here is stress again on the y-axis and then on the bottom axis we have the temperature times a constant in this particular problem that constant is 20 plus the log of the rupture time. So all of this is plotted on the bottom axis. So that's called the Larson-Miller parameter. Right? So that's what's plotted down here on the x-axis, this Larson-Miller parameter. Again, temperature in Kelvin, the rupture time in hours, and then a constant. The constant is a, is a fitting parameter. But make sure that you don't change the units here. Uh, you want your rupture time to be in hours, and the stress value here is in megapascals. So the C value that's used for the fitting is fit with a curve that is in megapascals there and has a rupture time in hours. All right, so in this particular case, C equals 20. So it actually took the data that we had before and it collapsed it now into a single curve. Uh, now these values down here, the Larson-Miller parameter, are all multiplied by 10 to the third. That's what this means here in the way that's designated the axis. So this would be 12,000, for example. It's a little confusing when people do this on the axes because you don't know when they write this 10 to the third whether they meant that they've already been multiplied by 10 to the third or whether you should multiply them by 10 to the third. So it's really a poor way of writing your axes. But in this case, these Larson-Miller terms are values like 12,000, right, on up to 28,000 here. So we need to put those kinds of numbers 
into this parameter when we're using it. So let's go ahead and look at an example. Um, what we're going to do is also when we get our data like this, rather than keeping this plot where we'd have to come on here and say, well, our sample feels 200 uh, megapascals of stress, come over here and come down and read off our Larson Miller parameter. We're just going to go ahead and fit this curve to a polynomial. So we can just go ahead and use our polynomial. We don't need an actual chart. Right, so we're going to fit that curve to a polynomial. And the polynomial, you can see here where the x value is just the log of the stress. And again, the stress, leave it in megapascals. And this is the log base 10, not the natural log. All right, so for some real data, this is an S590 alloy. You can see this one when you fit to the polynomial or just by looking at it with I, you can see that it's linear. Linear in, again, log stress. So our fitting parameters here, B0, the constant, B1, the coefficient of, of X. So you can see you're getting a linear equation back. These other ones are zero. X is log sigma again. And the C value in the Larson Miller fit for the data that collapse into one curve like this is now 17. And here's another one just showing that they're not always linear. So this is where you need the additional terms in that polynomial fit. And so here they are. And then this one has a C value of 20. Okay, so armed with that data, we can go ahead and now make our calculations. So let's say that we had an S590 uh, alloy and it was subject to a stress of 140 megapascals. So this is a constantly, uh, a constant applied stress. And we were at 800 degrees C, which is a significantly high temperature where we expect creep to be a problem. We wanna know how long that particular alloy would last. So we're gonna need first the Larson Miller parameter and we're given the fit. We just saw that on the last chart here. So we can go ahead and plug in. So again, these are going to be my B0, right? my B1 term, and then remember the X here is the log of the stress, so that's log of 140, right? Remember, keep it in megapascals. And we get out a Larson Miller parameter of 20,794. All right, so that's, going to be here, 20,794. And now we can go ahead and fill in the temperature in Kelvin, the C value that was given, which was 17. And then we're going to solve for the log of the rupture time. And that time, remember, is in hours. So there we go. We fill it everything in. We get 2.4 hours for the log, I should say this is log hours as the units actually. So that's the log of the rupture times 2.379 log hours. And so then we're gonna have to, to get the rupture time then just raise that as the power for um, 10. We get 239 hours or 10 days. All right, that is it for our creep case. Um, you can read about this is in your the last section in the chapter eight of your text, but uh, as you're redoing your reading, you'll see that creep is a process many times it is a result of grain boundaries sliding along one another. Uh, it's a diffusion process, so you do need these higher temperatures. And so conventional castings with small grains are going to have worse creep strain rates and short lifetimes because you have a lot more grains for sliding to occur. If you start looking at directional solidification, where this might be starting off solidifying down here, and instead of allowing grains to just form anywhere in the material, uh, it's controlled by a special furnace so that it starts at the bottom and grows this blade upward. And this can result in very long columnar type grains and much fewer 
And so in this case, the creep is much better. And then if you get even better at this, you can grow one single crystal. So this is actually a single crystal turbine blade. Now the creep is going to be dominated by strictly diffusion. We don't have any grain boundary sliding going on. And so this is the best case in terms of creep.